everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to introduce Andy Brand, who was born and raised in Connecticut. He graduated from the University of Connecticut with a BS and an MS degree in environmental horticultural and plant science. Um, for 27 years, Andy was employed at the Broken Arrow Nursery in Hamden, um, where he was the nursery manager. In March of 2018, Andy joined the staff at the Coastal Maine Botanical Garden as curator of living collections, and he is now the interim director of horticulture and gardens. Um, he also is the past president of the Connecticut New Nursery and Landscape Association and um, has done presentations on butterflies and such. So thank you, Andy, for joining us today. And um, we're ready to hear. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jean. Hopefully everybody can hear me and see the screen just fine. Um, I'm sorry this has to be uh, via Zoom and not in person. I was kind of looking forward to getting down to the Cape, um, but We'll save that for another lecture in a couple of years from now. I spoke to your group many years ago and had a great time when I did so. And um, I look forward to getting out there again. But today we'll do it through Zoom. And what I'd like to do today is kind of go through a few different things. I wanna give you a little insight into um, a little bit about me and how I came to the decision to leave a job I had for 27 years and, and pick up and move my family up to Maine. Um, and then focus the majority of the, the, the lecture on Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens and my four years here and just how my way of thinking about gardening and my appreciation for different types of plants has changed since I've been here for the four years. Um, and also just to share a handful of some of my favorite plants that I, I, I just, I, I love sharing my interest of plants and some of my favorites with, with various people to kind of get them excited about them as well. And hopefully you will by the end of the, the lecture. So as Jean said, I am born and raised in Connecticut. Uh, grew up right at the University of Connecticut in stores and went to the University of Connecticut and got my bachelor's and master's there in horticulture. And then uh, right out of school, I uh, ran a tissue culture lab for a small nursery that was doing some tissue culture, but also a large perennial grower. And then they decided just to become strictly perennials. So they closed down the lab and I was looking for a job and then met uh, Dick Janes, who is the uh, owner of Broken Arrow Nursery in Hamden, Connecticut. And I accepted a job there in 1990 and then remained there for 27 years. Um, it was kind of an interesting uh, change of pace for me. You know, when I, when I got out of school, I went to a, uh, doing the tissue culture was all inside. And then when I started at Broken Arrow, it was, mainly outdoors. And it was just Dick Janes and myself when, when we, I started at Broken Arrow Nursery. Um, and then 27 years later, 2018, I did move to Maine, my wife and I, um, and I took the job as plant curator at Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. Just a little bit more about me. I am a huge nature fanatic, um, all things, you know, plants, particularly native plants, but also insects and birds, I'm a big bird watcher. Uh, I started the Butterfly Association in Connecticut. I was one of the founding members. Um, I love to take photographs of everything out in nature and I'm not afraid as you can see here to get down on my belly and look at things up close. And really when I talk to people, I really stress the importance of people just taking the time and observing insects or plants or whatever it is out in nature and just to get a better appreciation and to connect with nature. I think we've lost that a lot in the past few years. You know, everybody's, you know, has their phones, you know, glued to their hands or their computers and such. And it, it, they just need to, it's so important to get outdoors and to really take the time and get a better appreciation of what's 
living around us and how important those things are. So as I said, I worked 27 years at Broken Arrow Nursery in Hamden, Connecticut. The owners are Dick and Sally Janes and they're still going strong and they're both in their mid eighties um, and the nursery's still thriving. Um, when I started there, as I said, it was Dick and myself. And then when I left in 2018, we had um, a working crew in the summer of 13 people. So that was pretty exciting to see the nursery grow from just mainly focusing on mountain laurels, which was our specialty and their companions. And then it expanded into a um, real specialty nursery known for being growers of rare and unusual trees, shrubs, and perennials, many of which you wouldn't find anywhere else in the country. So mountain laurel was our specialty. Uh, Dick Janes spent most of his life hybridizing mountain laurel. So this is typically the, the flower color you would see in the wild. But then due to his hybridizing work, we ended up being um, able to purchase so many different flower colors and habits. Um, and here are just a, a sampling of some of the different flower colors that are now available due to Dick's breeding work with Mount Moral. Um, things, you know, with striped flowers in the top, one in the bottom left is Minuet, which is a smaller growing form that only gets about three by three feet tall. And then some with these big, large pink flowers that you see in the right hand side here. So that was our focus. And then, as I said, we transitioned to becoming this um, destination nursery uh, known for its rare and unusual trees and shrubs. And here it just shows the diversity of plant material we were, we were selling. And then just before I left, a year or so before I left, we started doing mail order so we could then share our fun plants with people across the country. Um, they didn't have to necessarily come to the nursery um, to get the plants. They could, we could mail them off. So that is thriving right now. They're being able to ship plants to all different states of, across the United States. We were also responsible for um, introducing several plants. One of my favorites was uh, Clethra on the folia ruby spice, this pink flowering plant you see in the left hand side of the frame. Um, that's become super popular over the years. Um, it's a, a great native plant that attracts lots of different pollinators with its fragrant pink flowers. And then we've introduced um, when I was there, we introduced a, a pine called Little Giant, a uh, different uh, type of species of Stewardia that had these lovely soft pink flowers, and then also a couple of um, epimediums or barren warts, bishop's hats, um, we introduced as well. So it was a really fun time for me. Um, you know, I was completely in the commercial part of horticulture, you know, dealing with customers on a regular basis every day, sharing my knowledge and helping them with designs and you know, explaining what plants would be best in different situations. Um, and I loved it. And uh, you know, I would take my summer vacations. My family has a place up here in Midcoast, Maine on a lake. And we would come up here you know, every, every summer for at least two weeks. Um, sometimes more once we, we bought a place on the lake and I was able to have a permanent place to come up to. Um, I would visit, you know, two or three times a year. And I, I just fell in love with the main coast. You know, it, it's so beautiful. Um, <laughs> never seem to get tired of it. You know, there's always changing depending on what time of year you're here. Um, this was a view from my, uh, my parents' uh, lake, lake cottage. And I just fell in love with the area and knew that uh, my wife and I, you know, discussed it that eventually we would move up here. You know, I had, initially it was when we retired. My wife's a school teacher, and we figured, you know, a few more years, and when we retire, we'd move up up to Maine and, and enjoy the beauty that the state offers. I have a, a real strong passion for native plants, particularly northeastern natives. So I was, you know, very familiar with the plants you'd find growing here wild in Maine from the bunchberry in the left to the native viburnums to native uh, rhodora rhododendron in the bottom right with the lovely violet flowers. And I, you know, I fell in love with this flora and I, I was in just um, 
really enthusiastic about, you know, once I moved here to eat, learn even more because there's so many things, so many plants to learn. Um, you know, each day I tell myself there's some, a new plant I could probably go out and learn and find out information about. Um, and one of the rituals that I, I, I made a point to do when we came up on vacation was to visit Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. And I would do that at least once, sometimes twice during the two weeks that we stayed up here and got to know a lot of the, the uh, folks that worked here. And I, I just yeah. fell in love with the place. It had a completely different um, feel to it when you walk through the grounds of, of Coastal Maine versus walking through gardens like Longwood um, or the Arnold Arboretum. Um, just mo much more personable and you just have this really um, wonderful feeling as you walk through through the gardens that I, I really didn't experience in other gardens. And um, I knew after several visits that this would be a place that I, you know, I had planned on retiring and I thought, well, if I do move up here and retire that I could volunteer here. But um, <laughs> An opportunity came about. Um, the director, Bill Kalina at the time, was a good friend of mine, and he mentioned this job was becoming available. And my wife and I decided that this would be a good move, and I, I took a job at the gardens. And it was a bit, it was a tough choice, you know, living in a place for 27 years, um, raising your family, um, and you know, you develop such great relationships with colleagues and friends and you know, you're moving to a place where you have a few folks that you know, and it was a big change, but you know, there's always something better to gain, um, you know, when you make this change and you gotta you think positive and um, it was a good move. Um, we were excited, we, we love living here and uh, we don't regret uh, making this change of lifestyle. We left uh, both our kids who are, are older now, our daughter actually and her husband now own our old house in Hamden, which is kind of nice. So we can go back there and uh, visit the old stomping grounds. So we did move to Maine. This is uh, our 1880s farmhouse that we bought in Bristol, Maine. Um, went inside, fell in love with the place. It's, you know, literally you can smell the ocean from where we are. It's two miles. You, know, you can get to a, you know, working lobster. Uh, wharf so it's, it's a wonderful place to to live um the winters are are just as they were in connecticut i haven't experienced a particularly harsh winter which has been nice because people were scaring me as how harsh the winters are but i think because we are in the coast we're buffed by the uh, atmos atmosphere and conditions here and Shortly after I moved, I moved up to, to Maine on my own because my wife had to finish teaching in June there. And this is the neighborhood where our house is in Hamden. Shortly after I left, the tornado went through and, and kind of devastated the area. This is our backyard. We can see there was a lot of destruction and this was kind of jarring when this happened. You know, I just made this big move, change of change of life um, and you know my wife and family are still in the house and you know literally the majority of the trees around the house have been have been taken down so it was kind of made me kind of second guess myself but you know in the long run everything turned out okay um, unfortunately a lot of the shade plants I had became full sun plants because most of the trees as I said broke down uh, because of the high winds but, but we moved on and, you know, probably not only leaving family and friends, but the hard part too is leaving a garden that you've been caring for, for, you know, 27 years, you know, it's maturing and, you know, looking full and kind of what you had expected when you first started doing it. And to leave that all behind was very tough. But I also then looked, you know, at our house, there was really nothing around it. So um, I look at that as an opportunity to create new garden spaces to enjoy. And you also can do this when you have your family still living in the house and then buying the house from you, you can go back and dig up some of your favorite plants. And I did a little bit of that. And here you see just a sampling of the craziness I did those first uh, half, six months or so digging up plants and bringing them up to Maine. 
And then, you know, early on in March, I started the job at Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens and the gardens opened in 2007. So it's a relatively young garden. Um, and it opened thinking that we'd only get like 40,000 visitors. But as you can see, that quickly changed. And in 2017, we surpassed 190,000. And actually this year, and I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more, um, we greeted over 250,000 people to the gardens this year, which is the most ever, um, even before COVID, uh, which is just unheard of. Just an amazing summer this year. Very, very exciting. Um, it is one of the, it's the, one of the largest public gardens in the United States, and it's the largest in New England. We have roughly 295 acres in total, and 17 of those acres are cultivated garden spaces that include native plants as well as non-natives, and those non-natives are not invasive. Um, eventually, we're going to add a new propagation and horticulture facility and research uh, facility, as well as a conservatory building. Here shows you a kind of a drone shot of the gardens. Um, this building here in the center is our old visitor center. They built a new visitor center that opened a couple of years ago. Um, this building now serves as our marketplace and cafe. Um, and then you see the gardens surrounding this building. And the gardens are, are broken down into kind of individual garden spaces that are each um, designed and cared for by a horticulturalist. And what I'd like to do now is just kind of go through a few of those gardens just to share with you a few of the highlights of, of a couple of my favorite uh, aspects of each of those. We're gonna start with the Alphonse Children's Garden. And here you see it early in the spring. This is a very wonderful um, garden that really appeals to the imagination of people of all ages, particularly children. There are lots of um, whimsical um, things for kids to look at and to take part in. There's um, you know, play area, there are these very interesting forms of trees. There are a lot of the um, sculptures or things that are in the garden all center around children's storybooks that are written by main authors. Kind of Blueberries for Sal, for instance, is one of the uh, examples. Um, you see some of the buildings that are put in there with their neat little uh, picket fences around them with their green roofs. And there's, you know, one's a little tea house, the other's a story barn where we have volunteers that come in different times of the, of the day and read stories to children if they're there. Um, but here you see it in the spring full of uh, nice spring flowering bulbs and tulips. Um, here again in the spring, this is just another glimpse showing um, a boat that can, kids can get in and pretend that they're rowing, you know, across, across the pond or through the ocean, depending on their imagination. Um, and here you see it later in the summer, how it, things start to fill in. And it's just so many different colors and textures that are used in this garden. Just, um, it's just full, it's like a kaleidoscope of different flower colors and um, just, you know, when people walk through here, you the, the, the smiles on their faces and how happy they get when they enter this garden. Here you see, you know, kind of like um, Dr. Seuss trees with the weeping spruce and um, uh, camisipris that you see here. And then there is a uh, maze that we have near our sea, it's called the Seagull Pavilion. And this maze um, is a favorite with children. You know, they, they try to go through it to and see if they can get to the center without crossing the lines. Um, and before COVID, we had what are called Fairy Fridays where children would dress up with their little fairy wings and tutus and they would come down to this area in the midday on a Friday and they would celebrate Fairy Fridays and there would be bubbles and they would do fairy yoga. And it's just a wonderful place for children and adults to relax, to use their imagination and enjoy the space. But even, you know, the details on the fence, you know, here the, the fence is like a, um, you know, cat faces. So it's very whimsical and, and fun for, for people to see. And here you see the tulips 
uh, in the background in the frittle area in the front. And then even into the fall, we add things that appeal to people's imaginations with various scarecrows that are put up on the green roofs. And um, these are scattered throughout the gardens uh, in October. And here you see just some other things that we do in the children's garden. There you see some of the young girls enjoying Fairy Friday. But it's also used a lot by our education department, this, this children's garden. Uh, there's a pond and they use it uh, for teaching. And it's not just teaching children, you know, about what lives in the pond, but also plants and the importance of native plants. And it's, you know, the children are taught here, but also at adult education classes are done here too. So that's a big part, not just this garden, but all the gardens are used as teaching tools as well. And that's a big part of our mission at the gardens is to, you know, connect people with nature. And a big part of that is through education and through our programs that we, we offer people of all ages. And then just walking through the gardens, you know, you just get these wonderful meandering trail pathways that bring you, you know, close to all different types of plants, grasses and smoke bush on the left. Um, just has a wonderful feel for it. <laughs> you know, particularly here you see this foggy morning, you know, and it's like you can do this different times of the day, different times of the week and, and get a completely different sense of feeling and, um, you know, it gives you different types of emotions as you walk through the gardens at different points of the time of day or the year for that matter. Here you see the, a path going through the children's garden midsummer and you can just see, you know, the whole idea is to pack it full of different colors and just, you know, things that will give you flowering, you know, throughout the, throughout the spring and summer. There's always this much color going on. It's just a wonderful space. And then another great garden is the Learner Garden of the Five Senses. And this garden um, was designed so that any of the plants and other elements that are added to it would appeal to one of our five senses. Um, you know, so here, for instance, you have, um, you know, you're using your, your, your eyesight to see beautiful colors and textures, but also you're, you're hearing the, the fountain bubbling. And in the background, you see this, this stone uh, structure here with the, the hollowed out uh, circles. That's called our sounding stone. And you can, if you put your head inside there a little bit and hum, it resonates. So it gives you this really interesting feeling of vibration and <coughs> sound. Um, and there are two levels. So one for um, someone who is um, standing, but also then one purposely put much lower. So if people are, are disabled or in a wheelchair and, and, and cannot or shorter, they have the ability to also appreciate um, the sounds that you can get from this sounding stone. And this entire garden is created to be um, much more usable for people with any disability, whether it be mental or physical. Um, there are things, there are some of the labels in particular part of the garden have braille on them. So pe people with eyesight issues can, can you know, read the names of the plants and there are plants in there that if um, you break the stems or the leaves, they have wonderful fragrances. Um, plants with wonderful flowers that have a great fragrance, such as this um, sweet shrub, Calicanthus floridus. This is a, a favorite native shrub of mine. This grows down in the southeastern part of the U.S., but perfectly hardy here. And this has these wonderful maroon red flowers that have a very tropical uh, odor, fragrance to them that you can smell on like a, like a humid, hot day. They just emit this wonderful um, fragrance throughout the garden. It's a beautiful shrub. It can get eight by eight feet tall, um, so it does need some space, but a fantastic plant. And it will flower early, as, you know, <laughs> probably the best flowering is in May, but then because it flowers on new growth, it flowers sporadically throughout the summer. So that, that's a, a benefit of this plant. And just to show you a close up of those flowers, very, very pretty. My mom actually used to call it strawberry bush when she was growing up, they had one in her yard. And that's what they referred to it as because of the color of the flowers. And here, just another, um, you know, showing you the visual interest in the learner garden, but also if you see in the bottom, <laughs> this is a, a rock labyrinth. So, and what the way this was designed 
these stones, they're very smooth, rounded stones, and they're bigger at the beginning of the labyrinth. And as you work your way around till you get to the center, the size of the stones decreases and becomes very small until you get to the very center. So people are encouraged to take their socks and shoes off and um, walk this barefoot. So you really get a very appreciation of the sense of touch and the smoothness of the rocks and the change and the shape and the size of them. And you know, if you can do it with a friend and it's, it's very interesting to do with your eyes closed and you, you've really focused that sense of touch with your feet. Um, it's a very unusual and a, a pleasing feeling to your feet. We've also included a few examples of vertical walls. And what, what I really strikes me about, not just the vertical walls here, but just other things that we've included in the gardens throughout uh, coastal Maine. Um, intentionally, we're trying to create gardens and features that um, visitors can get ideas from and kind of think to themselves that there might be something that they can take home with them, you know, those ideas and possibly create similar um, features in their own yards, you know, maybe a, a bed, a, a display bed that they think they can do at home. Or this vertical wall is actually quite simple. It's maybe six and a half feet tall. Um, the baskets are actually made out of recycled um, lobster traps. And then it just has a, a, a ground cloth inside it. It's filled with, you know, potting mix and then small plants are put in. They're allowed to root in and then they're put in these vertical panels and, you know, watered periodically. They do really, really well. And it's just a really fun feature. One side features shade plants and then the other sides feature full sun plants. And then just as you continue to walk through the gardens, you walk through an area called the Great Lawn, which is just a wonderful place for people to grab a, a lunch and then go sit out and have a picnic lunch on the Great Lawn. And then just, you know, be surrounded by all these bright colors of black-eyed Susans and echinaceas, the cone flowers. Um, and we also, we try to include um, some really interesting uh, sculptures in the garden. We have both permanent sculptures that are there year round every year. And then we have some temporary sculptures that are brought in. Um, here you see on the left, probably one of my favorites. And this just slowly with the slightest wind just slowly spins. Um, and it's just a wonderful um, element to add. And we've surrounded it with different types of, of ornamental grasses. So this time of year in particular, when the grasses are you know, put out, putting out their seed heads and their plumes, and it's a little breezy, they're swaying in the wind. You get this sculpture that's slowly rotating um, with the wind as well. It's, it's a beautiful thing to, to witness. And George Sherwood, Sherwood is known for these um, different moving sculptures, kinetic sculptures. And then here, just an example, one we had a few years ago of a temporary, um, sculpture of these, someone carved these beautiful um, swallows that were put on these eight foot um, poles that were placed throughout the one garden here. And this is part of the Great Lawn. And it just, you know, even on a, a dark kind of a gloomy day with a little bit of sun, you know, the shiny birds, you know, appeared like they were hovering over the bright red of the uh, hibiscus you see here. And this hibiscus is called Midnight Marvel. But this year, we were very excited to have um, Thomas Dambo. He's a Danish artist who created these five giant wooden trolls made out of all recycled, repurposed pallets and wood. Um, and they were known as the Guardians of the Seeds. And there was this whole tale that he created uh, about the trolls. And they, um, we're protecting the forest and the seeds of our forest trees. And the theme and the, the um, story of the trolls was their intent was to encourage people, our visitors, to know more about the environment and to protect the environment, how important it is that we become better stewards of the environment, or we're going to lose our trees and we're going to have an environment that's not going to support 
a lot of creatures and insects and birds and other animals. And if we start losing lots of those, we are gonna have serious problems ourselves as humans. So that was the whole story about these trolls. And it was, we, it's part of really a great part of our mission, you know, that fit perfectly in with our mission to connect people with nature. And, you know, our intent was to get people to come visit the gardens, find the trolls, learn their story, learn about the environment, learn about nature and how important it is that we preserve nature and do what we can to, to help all living creatures. And it ended up, as I said earlier, we had a massive influx of visitors this year. Over 250,000 people came to see the trolls and um, hopefully to leave with a better appreciation of nature and to take that message home with them and hopefully relay it to their friends and you know do you know change some of the, their practices at home to improve um, the chances of all things surviving uh, in the world today. And they've been fantastic. These things are massive. You just, just a couple, there are three other ones that you see here and these are 20 to 25 feet tall. They are massive creatures. Um, and they're gonna, be, they're gonna be here for, you know, we're predicting five to seven years until they start to break down and return to the earth. Um, at which point, you know, if we think they're gonna be unsafe for people to, you know, be near, we will have to take them down. But uh, we're hoping for to get a good seven years from them. So if you haven't had a chance to come see them, you'll have uh, several years in the future to come on up and visit these trolls. They're fantastic. Here's one of, this is the baby troll, Lilia, reaching out and everybody wants to get in there and give her a big hug. Probably one of my, if not my favorite garden is the Haney Hillside. And I, I, you know, my interest in native plants is probably one of the main reasons I love this because the Haney Hillside does incorporate more native plants than any other garden we have here. Um, so this kind of the Haney Hillside uh, brings you down from the main part of the gardens and you meander down these wonderful pathways till you get to the shoreland trail or which takes you along the back river which is a tidal river here at the gardens but you see here this is the height of the summer and what I love about it is it, it showcases how important foliage is in the garden um, you know, very little is in flower here, except for you see this, this is a native spirea, the lavender uh, violet flowers here. But you see the, the smoke of this smoke bush on the top, this bright yellow is uh, tiger eye sumac. Um, and then in the front here, this big massive green, this is uh, an Amsonia hubrichtii, a big mass planting. And then at the bottom, you get this, um, this is a native Acer Pennsylvanicum or sedge here at the bottom here along the pathway. And I love the way it just softens the edge of the path. It's not a real hard edge. It looks almost like a river of grass coming down the hillside. Um, just shows people that just how you can take all these different native plants, put them in these wonderful combinations to you know, create this really magical uh, garden space. Here you should, See, this is the Amsonia in flower earlier in the spring with surrounded by this kind of river of, of sedge. And this is bringing you up from the, from the river coming up the Haney Hillside. This is actually very, very early in the gardens, um, probably a couple of years after they opened. So it's very young, these trees, if you came to visit now, um, these trees are probably now 20 to 30 feet tall, so it's much more enclosed. But you see, it's just this wonderful um, garden that brings you from, from more formal gardens. And then as you come down the hillside, you come through these native plants, and then eventually you're brought into the wild main woods. You then just enter into the woods. You have the river on your left, and then you just take these pathways and you know, there are no buildings, no other people around, and you feel literally that you're just, you could be anywhere in the state of Maine walking through the woods. So it's a wonderful transition from, you know, more formal cultivated gardens then into wild, um, wild Maine woods. And you can then go off on different uh, woodland trails to take you 
through different, you know, moss laden rocks and all sorts of beautiful uh, settings. One thing I really appreciated um, by my move to Maine was uh, I, 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 I developed a better appreciation <coughs> annually. Um, you know, being at Broken Arrow, you know, we concentrated on trees and shrubs and perennials and no, no annuals. We didn't grow any, any annuals whatsoever. Um, but here, you know, annuals play a, a big role. You know, we, we start greeting visitors in late April, May, and, you know, we're known for our bulb displays. And that was very new to me before I, you know, until I got up here. And I just developed this much stronger interest and appreciation for, for annuals, you know, particularly bulbs. You know, I pretty much dismissed them, but, you know, tulips, there are so many kinds and just, you know, the, the combinations you can create with the tulips and other bulbs, you know, I, I just, um, just really fell in love with the different uses that I found here and what the horticulturists were doing throughout the gardens. Um, but also just annuals in, in general, I, I, I didn't know them well at all. And I feel now I really, you know, started to learn many more of them. And some of them, um, I, we've developed ways where um, we're taking them. So it's not just like masses of petunias and masses of this. There, we use that to some extent, but we're creating ways where you can take these unusual annuals and incorporate them with perennials and with shrubs and create these wonderful, you know, tapestries of colors and flowers um, that work in these really wonderful combinations um, with, you know, plants from the annuals, perennials, trees and shrubs. Um, and then, you know, come this time of year when we pull the annuals, there's still this backbone of the garden left. And then we can create um, new scenes next year, just incorporating different annuals and the spaces that were avail are available to us by removing the older ones. You know, succulents here, are, these are examples of window boxes that we do in the children's garden with echeverias in the bottom here. Um, and then different other types of succulents that you see here. Just wonderful combinations, you know, that appeal, that are beautiful to look at, but then you know, low maintenance. We're, we're trying to become really sustainable here at the gardens and you know, utilizing plants that once they get established aren't requiring our constant attention and, and you know, constant watering, um, you know, and succulents are a perfect example, you know, <laughs> plant them and, you know, typically if we have regular rains, we'll be okay and they require very little maintenance, which is very important for us because we, you know, we only have our staff right now, we have 11 full-time horticulturists that maintain 18 acres or so of, of plantings. Love in the mess. You know, many of these plants I had no idea, no familiarity with until I moved up here. And I just, you know, they, they offer such a, you know, a range of colors and shapes of flowers and textures of foliage. And, you know, they flower all spring and summer, you know, until we get a really hard frost and they just, offer so many possibilities in the garden. Here's love in the mist. I just, the, such an unusual flower. <laughs> um, or dianthus, you know, people are familiar with the different types of di dianthus that look like, you know, many carnations and have that lovely clove fragrance, which I, I knew about, but here's one called green ball where it's like literally these flower clusters that are the shape of a tennis ball that are up on these stems. And here you see it mixed in with trailing uh, dichondra, the silver you see in the bottom. But then also you get the shape of the, the dianthus then mimicking these um, really little quirky um, three foot tall um, ceramic sculptures that are mixed in. So you get that repetition of the shape of the flower with the sculpture as well. And here's that dichondra used with pineapple lilies or eucomus. Um, just a wonderful combination, you know, it looks like these, these pineapple lilies are just emerging out of the sea of silver. Um, and then they have these unique flower clusters that resemble um, somewhat skinny uh, pineapples. And just, you know, this is just an example of what you can do with 
all these different types of, of annuals. These are all different annuals. And many of the annuals in this garden, this is a children's garden again, um, we, we allow some of them to seed in. So then we get these little bits of color here and there, like this bottom uh, variegated plant. This is a euphorbia that we've allowed to seed in periodically just to give that pop of silvery white uh, variegation that you see here. And again, more annuals. And here you see how they're used mixed in with different types of perennials. You know, this, this bright yellow coneflower here with Joe pie weeds and ornamental grasses and shrubs, but then mixing in the annuals to, you know, fill in those gaps of open soil um, and then just mixing in the colors. So they all kind of this wonderful color combinations that you see here. We also have kind of focused on collecting some different types of, of plants. Um, and one focus recently has been different types of ornamental onions or the alliums. Um, if you're looking for a plant for later summer flowering and you're looking for things that appeal to honeybees and other, um, some of our native pollinators, uh, the ornamental onions are great. And this millennium is a fantastic plant, covers itself with these flowers, um, you know, has strap-like foliage, kind of chive, like a little fatter than a chive type foliage, but then these, um, oh, probably half dollar size flower clusters that come up and they flower for a couple of weeks later in the summer and adored by different types of, of uh, pollinators. But just to show you the diversity that you can um, get with these ornamental onions, you know, Globe Master, some of you may know, has you know, stands three to four feet tall with, you know, softball size flower clusters. Schubertii in the right hand side has this open kind of tumbleweed look type of flower uh, head that you see here. Um, purple Kala you see here about two feet tall with maybe uh, baseball size flower heads, but here mixed in with spireas flowering in the background. And these are coming up through ferns. What a wonderful combination this is. Christophii, the star of Persia. Here it's mixed in with a, a flowering hyssop. Um, you see these th hundreds of little star-shaped flowers clustered together. Wonderful, wonderful plants. And you know, with alliums, you can get alliums that'll start flowering for you early in the spring. And then some that'll extend. The latest one we have is actually still in flower now. It's uh, Allium thumbergii ozawa, which is just in full peak. Peak bloom right now. So alliums will, different types of species, you can have some and have them flowering throughout the summer. The drumstick allium with these wonderful um, drumstick shaped flowers with a kind of a maroon and green bicolor effect. Oh, sorry. And then how about incorporating some masterworts or strantias? This is a really interesting group of plants that we've got probably, oh, I'd say six or eight different cultivars of now that a wonderful sun plant perennial that we've, I've come to really love, an unusual flower form that has these kind of spiky bracts behind the tiny true flowers that you see in the center here. Um, and they come in shades from white through light pink to a dark kind of a burgundy red coloration. They grow full sun, two to two and a half feet tall, clump forming plant. Um, just to, I, I love them just because of the unusual flowering and a long flowering period. Um, we've had some in flower for a couple of months. And here, just to show you another example of a, a paler flowering one here, you see mixed in with some uh, spiky Veronica's that the spikes in the background here, those are a type of Veronica. Epimediums, if you're looking for a um, wonderful shade plant, epimediums uh, are probably my favorite um, perennial for shade. I, I collect them or did collect them, particularly when I was in Connecticut, I had a collection of about 150 different uh, types of epimediums. And what I love about them is the diversity of flower colors and shapes that they can bring to the garden in April. Um, 
They are drought tolerant. Once they get established, I had many of mine growing under these monstrous Norway spruce um, and they did really, really well. There are clump forming forms. There are uh, spreading forms that spread by rhizomes. So you can have some that are ground covers, which are very uh, usable in the, in the landscape. Um, great for early blooming. Um, they also have wonderful foliage as well. Some are evergreen, some come out with um, maroon foliage in the spring. Here you see another uh, species. This is Fargesii, just to show you a different type of flower compared to the um, kind of big spurred flowers you see here on pink champagne. And most of the epimediums will grow anywhere from eight to 20 inches tall, depending on the selection or the species. And again, I mentioned flower color, um, foliage color. Here you see sandy claws with these long spiky foliage. And here's a, a wonderful ground covering form called Peralchicum whistly. And this one, if you don't cut it back, um, will still have wonderful evergreen foliage through December. Nice glossy dark green foliage. And then in the spring, these bright yellow flowers come up above the foliage and it's a wonderful contrast between the yellow and dark green. And for me, I typically, even with these so-called evergreen types, I would cut most of my epimediums back early in the spring, late winter, just so that the old foliage does not interfere with the flowers as they're emerging out of the ground. And here you see that foliage that I did leave on well into December and how beautiful it is. A few favorite shrubs, um, Calicanthus, I did mention the um, Floridus when I was talking about the Lerner Garden and how wonderful that tropical fragrance of the flowers was. That was um, hybridized with a uh, Asian species and you got these uh, hybrid sweet shrubs. And this is a beautiful shrub. It gets very big, so it does need a lot of space, 10 by 10, full sun, part shade. This is a selection called Hartledge Wine. These flowers, unfortunately, don't have the fragrance, but they, the size, they're about two inches across. And it's a profuse bloomer, has these really nice dark green, uh, shiny foliage that uh, act as a wonderful backdrop to these deep maroon flowers. Um, and it flowers uh, throughout the summertime. It'll continue to flower on new wood, which is a benefit. Um, and it's one of those that will periodically go in and prune it back pretty hard and you will lose some of the flowering. Um, it won't be as profuse the following year, but then that second year um, after pruning, you'll get uh, blessed with a bunch of flowering again, but it's just a wonderful flowering shrub. You know, Lily of the Valley, you know, people either love it or they hate it. Um, I've never been a fan of it because it is pretty aggressive ground cover, um, but if it's used in the right place, it can be very effective. Um, moving to Maine and to CMBG, I became familiar with two new selections, uh, Fernwoods Golden Slippers and Cream de Mint that were both named by a nursery up here in Maine. Um, and here you see them used in combination. And I just love this look. The, it almost sparkles uh, between the yellow foliage of the golden slippers and then the variegated foliage of cream de mint. And here having birch trees come up through the middle of it. It's just, uh, I think in my opinion, a beautiful use of the lily of the valley. It does have those wonderful fragrant bell-shaped flowers. Um, and this will grow part shade to shade it, and it does run and you know you can see that not much else is coming up through this and it really develops kind of an impenetrable ground cover so it needs to be placed in an area where pretty much that's all you want to have there don't plan on planting a heuchera or some other perennial in it it's just it will overtake any perennial you try to plant within that so here we have planted on the edge of it and we're controlling the um, convalaria is a type of clematis or clematis. And rather than being a climbing form, this is a shrub form. This is a native 
uh, form of clematis that grows just in a couple of isolated areas down in the southeastern part of the US, but it does really, really well here in Maine. And it's called Addison's leather flower, but it is a clematis. And rather than having the big showy um, flowers, it has um, these little bell flowers. And this, what I love most about this is how long this flowers. It'll start flowering in May and then will continue to flower throughout July um putting out flowers and i particularly love the use of this with the yellowish foliage behind it because these little maroonish purple bells stand out and they're very thick petaled to these bells and here's another picture just to show you how we're we continuously have to keep the convalary away from it but i just love this effect it kind of just mounds on itself and then is surrounded by these lovely uh, yellow foliage of the convalaria, and then the foliage is a rounded, almost a blue-green color of the clematis. It's a great form, and this is one you can probably find mainly from mail order sources, I think is where I've seen it listed before um, as far as availability, and that's the clematis is what I'm speaking of there. This is um, a relative of witch hazels, Dysanthus. This is a, a Asian plant that uh, really does well in shade, part shade situations. And what I love about it, it has wonderful pest-free foliage, kind of heart-shaped foliage that looks like a red bud. And red buds, if you're familiar with those, the, the Latin name for red bud is Circus. So you see the genus, the species name for Dysanthus is Circitifolius. So kind of means that the foliage resembles a Circus or a Ketsura tree, which is Circitifilum. So you see, if you put those side by side, the foliage would all kind of look very similar. So that um, kind of shows you how that, what that specific epithet or the species name is referring to, um, is that resemblance to a red bud or the Ketsura tree. Um, but you see here, this plant, I would grow for the fall color. Um, it gives you a kaleidoscope of reds and oranges and yellows and purples and, um, it's fantastic shrub because it does this type of coloration in shaded high canopy shade situations. Um, it kind of has a, an arching vase shape habit to about eight feet tall, eight feet wide. It's one that you can plant smaller shade loving perennials and shrubs underneath if you'd like. Um, and it is, as I said, it's related to witch hazel. So it's in the, the, the witch hazel family. And here you see the habit of it in a, a high canopy shade situation with ferns growing underneath it. And I think maybe oak leaf hydrangea as well. And here you see the flowers that are actually opening right now in October here in Maine. And you can see their resemblance to the spidery flowers of witch hazels. Um, so you can see how they could be considered to be placed in the same family because they do have um, the similar uh, flower characteristics that you see here. They're tiny, so you do need to, to get up close and, and look at them, um, you know, close inspection to the stems. They're not as big as a witch hazel flower. Father Gellis, this is another native shrub to the southeast. Um, many of you may use uh, some of the Father Gillas. Mount Airy is a selection. Uh, uh, blue Shadow is another one with blue-green foliage. Uh, there's both uh, Gardenii, which is the dwarf Father Gela, but also Major, which is the tall Father Gela. These are wonderful native shrubs that grow again, part shade to full sun situations. They have white bottle brush flowers in May. Um, Gardenii grows typically two to three feet tall. This selection, Harold Epstein, tops out at two feet. It's a nice low growing uh, shrub that here it's used in the Haney Hillside as an edging plant. Um, it has wonderful little bottle brush flowers in May. There's sweet fragrance to them as well. Probably of all the different types of Father Gilla, this has the best fragrance in my opinion. The flowers are about an inch tall, but super, super fragrant. They come out before the foliage that you see here and then you're treated 
um, to that wonderful dark green foliage that then becomes beautiful shades of, of oranges and yellows and, and reds in the fall. So Father Gill, I would definitely, it's one of those that has, a, it's a multi-season shrub. You get the flowers, then you get beautiful foliage through the, the summer months, and then you you have a wonderful a fall display as well on the foliage. I mentioned witch hazels. Um, you know, we have a native witch hazel that's in flower now, Hamamelis virginiana, that you'll see throughout the woods of New England with its yellow flowers. Often they can be kind of hidden because the foliage is still on them. Um, but we also have another native uh, witch hazel called the vernal witch hazel, which grows in the um, Arkansas area, in the Ozark Mountain region. It's just a limited area, but it does really well here in New England. Um, vernal witch hazel typically grows seven to eight feet tall with an upright base shaped habit. It flowers in the springtime. It has tiny flowers, strap-like petals, um, and vernal witch hazel is fragrant too. So some of you may grow some of the hybrid X intermedia witch hazels that can have yellow or orange or red flowers. This will flower at the same time. Usually this is in flower, depending on how cold our spring is, it can start flowering in March, late, late February, probably for you and on the Cape, it could be sometime in mid to late February if you have a, a warmer, a warm up in that time of year. Um, and the flowers will open. And then if we, re, we get cold again, the flowers kind of retract and, and pull back into their, you know, curl their petals around themselves again. But this form called Quasimodo, which I just love growing just because of the name alone, um, is a dwarf form of the vernal witch hazel. And it will only get about three feet tall and wide. So it's very dense. As you can see, this, this is the habit. It's a rounded, dense habit. This hasn't been pruned. This is how it grows uh, with no pruning. And then in the spring, you know, early spring, so March, um, this is in full flower. And it covers itself with these tiny little orange strap-like flowers that have probably one of the strongest fragrances of some of our early spring flowering shrubs. Um, so this is one because of its habit, I would recommend planting it near a pathway or that you're gonna frequent this time of year. You know, So in late February, March, where you're gonna be walking by maybe to get to the car or go out to the mailbox, have this nearby so when this is in flower, you can appreciate it, that fragrance. And it's great too, you can cut the branches, bring a few inside and it will emit this beautiful perfume uh, inside the house as well. And just a couple perennials real quick um, that I really learned about after moving here to coastal Maine. You know, many people are familiar with bee bombs, you know, the bright red ones that are, are used to attract hummingbirds. Um, but the spotted bee balm is very unusual for the way it flowers. You can see the resemblance of the flowers to the red forms here, these tubular flowers. But these are um, backed by these wonderful kind of lavender pink bracts that support that are just underneath the um, spotted tubular flowers that you see here. And this is one that will slowly uh, spread by rhizomes, it has stems that reach 24 to 30 inches tall, full sun is ideal, um, you know, loved by different types of bees and other pollinators, you know, bumblebees and, and um, hummingbirds do. I've seen hummingbirds to it as well as different types of butterflies. Um, and it'll just add a really unique color and, and texture to the garden as does the uh, Turkish sage, Flomus. This was completely new to me before moving here. Um, this is a perennial that will send up these interesting um, spikes of flowers that are kind of stacked on each other. Like in these tiers, you get this cluster of tubular flowers and then a break and then another cluster. And you can get four or five of these that'll stand maybe three to three and a half feet tall um, coming from a, a rosette of these big basal uh, dark kind of um, kind of triangular shaped foliage that you see with kind of a matte gray green finish to that to that look um, you see here with these lovely lavender um, yellow flowers that here are contrasting with the beautiful powder blue of the um, Abe's con color. 
And just one other um, native I wasn't familiar with. I thought I knew most of the native plants that grew in our region. This was completely new to me, Sternanthium um, graminium. And this is Eastern Featherbells. The foliage of this uh, reminded me of the foliage of a daylily or a yucca plant. Um, kind of a, a clump of strap-like, grass-like foliage that you see in the bottom left here that could get up to 20 inches tall. And then these flowering spikes of, you know, just this froth of white that would come up on these spikes that could get four to five feet tall above this um, uh, clump of foliage. And they flower um, mid to late summer and they would come up and just give this um, really kind of a magical show of, of flowers that you see here standing very tall with these tiny little white flowers, but you know, this inflorescence could be, you know, two and a half feet long, you know, from the bottom up to the top. Um, and then again, flowering for up to a month. And it was just new to me. And I, I kind of, I love that coming to places and learning about new plants and then trying them in the garden and encouraging visitors to try them. This is another one that is not really common in commerce, but another one I, I think you could find if you did some searching online. And this is the Eastern Featherbells. And here you see it growing next to a PG hydrangea, hydrangea paniculata. And then one thing we've just really tried to um, show our visitors is the way to to incorporate both native and non-native plants. And when we use native, we're using strictly plants that are not invasive. Um, but just showing people, as I mentioned earlier, ways that they can combine plants together, natives and non-natives, in ways that they can get ideas to take home with them. You know, I, I find these gardens that we have here very relatable to our visitors. And I think that they really appreciate that. And, can leave with so many different ideas to take home and, and try in their own yards. And here you see native ferns growing with, you know, non-native hostas and uh, polygonatums or Solomon seals. Again, you know, the ladies mantle with hostas and then native ferns. And what we try to do is create just different types of combinations um, and really stress the importance of foliage, you know, because with the flowers, they're gorgeous. And we do try to incorporate plants that flower for a long period of time. And as I mentioned, the use of annuals to, to give nonstop flowering, but um, the use of foliage and mixing that with different types of flowers and different types of foliage and mixing all these textures together to create endless types of combinations. And the last few slides are just showing you different types of combinations that we've created here at uh, Coastal Maine. You know, here you see different types of, of annuals mixed together. Again, you know, here, petunias and, you know, perennial um, sages and delphiniums and an annual called kangaroo paws, is this rose color that you see on the left. And here are the fennels and drumstick alliums that you see here in flower with calendulas, all adding different colors of flowers and the lacy texture of the fennel mixing in beautifully. And then here, just the contrast, the gorgeous dark maroon glossy foliage of a weeping beech tree um, used as a backdrop for the PG hydrangea uh, as it's changing from its brilliant white cones to pink flowers as they fade to then eventually a tan that you know just stands out beautifully with the dark maroon fo uh, foliage color. And then just to wrap up, you know, I, I have about a 30 minute drive now from my house to the gardens and, you know, my, my commute when I lived in Connecticut to the nursery was five minutes and I was like, oh, this commute 30 minutes, but, you know, it's, it, it's a commute that I, I don't, um, 
I don't dread because there's always something kind of interesting to see. And one of my favorite sites that I see in the in the early summer are the lupins that you know Maine is known for. You know, these aren't the native lupins, but it's a lupin that has kind of spread to to open meadows and fields throughout throughout the state and has been kind of, you know, just become a, a kind of an icon here in, in the area. And it's it's just something that I really look forward to seeing every year now. And, you know, I, I love sharing them with people and, you know, people come up here to see the fall foliage, but I think there are also people that come up in the earlier summer just to see the lupins and flower because they are such a beautiful um, sight to see and just, reminds me when I, there's ever that thought in my head of reasons why, geez, you know, should we have stayed in Connecticut? You know, this just really instills that we, we did make a, a, a right choice and making the move to Maine. Um, and one thing I, just to, to finish up, I thought it was interesting um, just to share with you all. These are the two missions of the two places that I have, where I have worked and I am working. And you see here that the mission or the vision of Broken Arrow Nursery was, in, was to inspire you know, a love of plants and, and to enrich the lives of our customers through you know, great unique plants that we were growing and then you know, educating people with the knowledge we, ha we had and to enjoy to freely share that with, with everybody. And then comparing that with the mission of, of CMBG, which is to again, inspire those connections with our visitors, you know, with, with people and connecting people with plants and nature. And it's through horticulture, which is the, our gardens and through our plants, but also our education and then the research that we're, we plan to do. So I just thought it was just interesting that I've, I've selected two career moves where there is such overlap with with their missions that, um, you know, yes, I've gone from commercial to public horticulture, but um, bringing those two missions from each of them and, and kind of just melding them together um, and then using, utilizing my love of plants and knowledge that I have and being able to share it with our visitors and then today sharing it with you all and, um, Hopefully you've learned something about some of the plants um, that we have here in Maine and a little bit more about the gardens. And, you know, it's my hope that, um, you know, as COVID settles down, some of you can, you know, make the, the drive up here and plan to spend, you know, Booth Bay is a wonderful area to, to spend a, a weekend and, and take a visit. Maybe you can set up a field trip and bring a bus up and, and stay at one of the local uh, bed and breakfast or hotels here and we'd love to have you next year um, we open up typically May 1st um, and here's just my contact if you you know have any questions you know once we get done if we don't answer them today you know there's my email um, and my phone number or you can drop me a, drop me a note here at the gardens with a mailing address there too or you can even find me on social media um, I have a couple of Instagram and, and Facebook pages that I, I, I have. You can follow me on there too. And I like to do photography and do a lot of Instagram posts. So um, with that, um, I see, I think we have a couple of questions possibly in the chat. Um, but if, then if there are any questions people want to, um, to ask, we can unmute everybody, I guess. Maybe Naomi, you can do that. And I can stop sharing my screen and we can then um, see everybody. I always like to see people's faces um, and when I'm when answering questions and all. So let's see if we can do that. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer any right now. The name, I see one now, the name of the sedge on the hillside was Pennsylvania sedge. That was Carex Pennsylvanica. That's one that'll grow, it grows throughout the woods um, in our area here.
what else do we have here? So when are the gardens open to visit? So we just closed on Sunday. We will, we have a, a holiday light show that opens November 20th and goes through January 1st. And then we will reopen the gardens on May 1st in 2022, and then we'll be open again until mid-November. And we're open every day. And it is, you do need to make reservations. And we started that when COVID was so bad, and we're gonna continue that it's worked really well having timed reservations. So it's easy to make reservations online for a particular time of day when you wanna come visit. But May 1st will be our opening day. And I'd say the height of the gardens, if you wanted to see the most color would be sometime in June, early July would be the time I would recommend to see the most, most plants in flower and the most color of textures and such. Blue flowers planted with the alliums. Um, I'm gonna see if I can go back to that real quick and find out for you. The blue flowers with the allium, that was a uh, type of hyssop, I believe, the dark blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It may be a plant called Crater Lake Blue, I believe. How do we prevent rabbits and deer? We do have deer and we do have some issues. They manage to find their way through fence. Um, we have had good success with a material called liquid fence, which is something that needs to be applied periodically. It smells horrible. Um, so we try to apply it usually at the end of the day. So then it has a chance to um, you know, dry on. So then when visitors come back the next morning, it doesn't smell like, you know, rotten, rotting eggs and, and terribleness. But we've had really good luck putting that on our hostas and plants. And that's done a good job to keep uh, rabbits and deer. We actually have issues more with voles and such. So we're trying to get everything cut back in the, in the fall now to prevent them from girdling our trees and digging up clumps of our perennials as well. But it's, it's a constant battle. And I know I, I battle it right there with you at home too. Um, and we've tried to plant some things that are less prone to deer, like alliums are a great one. They get left alone, which is nice because they taste like onions. Other questions? Anybody want to ask one in, in person? They can unmute themselves if they can and ask it in person. Um, happy to answer them. We've got a few more minutes if need be. I believe I'm not uh, muted, but I, I'm trying to type it out, but it's taking me too long. About 20 years ago, I planted a Dysanthus uh, Sarasinifolia in my woodland. There's quite a bit of shade, but there's, there's, there's it's not heavy shade, but, uh, and it is kind of failing. And I, I don't, uh, I have to cut branches back. And I, I, it's the fall foliage. I just really, it used to be. Yeah, so exactly. Fall. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. If I cut um, it, if I cut it back all the way, will I get regrowth or should I just? Yeah, I mean, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, go to like five or six inches, but you could cut it. I would try cutting it like in half and see what happens. Um, is it failing, but it's just not putting new growth out or what's, yeah, what's happening? Yeah. Not, not putting out new growth and, and a branch is going, a whole branch going. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, a heavily, it's horticulturally, it's not in the best, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be just natural. <laughs> yeah. You know, you could, you know, the other thing too is if there's a lot of leaves, I mean, sometimes just check the base too in case some animal has gotten in there and girdled some of the lower parts of the stem. We've had that sometimes we've noticed like a branch failing and 
when you actually get in and look closely at the stem, you can, we've sometimes found where a vole or something has, has literally chewed a good chunk of the bark off and that sometimes will lead to branches failing or, you know, sometimes an insect can get in and bore part of the stem, but that, you know, if you're only seeing one branch fail, that kind of wilts like that a lot of times, that indicates there may be, you know, a bore or something that, something's interfering with the uptake of nutrients and water to that stem. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I recently visited the garden and um, in some areas there seemed to be a lot of signage uh, to identify the plants and in others um, I had trouble finding, figuring out what the plant was. Yeah. I had to go to picture this. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a good point. So the, um, for a few years there was, before I was hired, there was, there was no curator. So new labels were not being created. And then we, there was an issue with the engraver had, had broken. So there was a, there was a, a backlog of getting labels created and we now have a new engraver and we've hired uh, a nice young person who has been spending his time engraving new labels. So he, since he's only been here for two months, he's just put a hundred, uh, 650 new plant labels in the gardens and he's gonna continue doing that. So next time you visit, you will see lots of plant labels. So yeah, unfortunately that was just something that was a little bit out of our control. And, um, you know, with such a major expansion, I think um, the major expansion required a lot of planting. So that took some of the time away from um, someone being able to spend as much time putting new labels into the gardens. But now with having someone pretty much full-time working on that, the focus has been put on that. And when you come back, you will not need to use your phone and you will be able to hopefully see um, uh, labels, engraved labels with each plant. Great, thanks. Yeah. Andy, I was wondering if you saw in the chat that Gary Bowden asked if you guys are going to retail any of your native plants. Um, there's no immediate plan to do that. Um, I think in the future there will be plans once we develop and we build the new greenhouse facilities and propagation area. I think that'll give us much more space and opportunities to, to propagate our native plants. Right now, I think the only thing that we're doing is we're providing people with some seeds of some of our native milkweeds that we grow here at the gardens that are sold in the garden shop. Thank you. Andy, um, this is Deirdre White. I'm, I'm interested um, in your move um, mm -hmm. from Connecticut to Maine. And um, what were some of the, I mean, just in terms of the environment and um, people and your surroundings, what were some of the um, most interesting things about your move and getting settled into such a different environment? Yeah, so it was, so I grew up in rural Connecticut, you know, compared mm -hmm. to Hamden. Hamden was suburban, you know, it was just outside of, of, of New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale and such is. Um, and it was very, very busy. And I really, I lucked out because the house we, we bought from, from actually the owners of Broken Arrow, um, I was fortunate to have six acres of land behind me and we had a rails to trails next to the house. So I had opportunities to get away from the busyness of Hamden. And the nursery too was an opportunity to be outdoors a lot. And I'm not a person, I enjoy going to the city and I, but I don't like staying there. Um, and, you know, I think vacationing in this area of Maine, I was, I think the familiarity with this area played a role in my decision to move here. Um, and knowing some of the people at the gardens um, helped out a lot. And I, I, I love being on the coast. Mm -hmm. And I, I found even the times when I would visit here that 
the a much more laid back at, um, tendency of the people who live here mm -hmm. compared to, I found it much more frantic in Connecticut. Um, and not that people were so la laid back that things didn't get done, but the whole pace of life seemed much more relaxed here. And I like kind of the more small town, hometown feel that where I am in near the town of Damascata in Bristol, um, I, I just, that appealed to me much more than where I was living in South Central Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, we, we enjoyed living where we did in Hamden. We, you know, our kids enjoyed it. They had a great, you know, growing up there. It was great for them. Um, you know, going to school in a suburban high school, I think was great for them to expose, to be exposed to all kinds of cultures um, that they were there. Um, but, you know, I love the, you know, going and the little farm stands and the CSAs here and, you know, the small theaters you can go to that hold, you know, a hundred people and, you know, is still, you know, the, the old box office and, um, you know, the bookstores and such and the little cafes and very, very friendly people, um, you know, and being able to live on the coast in uh, a way where I'm not gonna be in debt forever. Um, I have to say taxes were a big part of it. Um, yeah. property taxes. <laughs> you know, in Connecticut, you know, property tax on an acre of land where I was living was about $10,000. Mm -hmm. and, and here in Bristol, the taxes on the land that I have, which is almost two acres is under $1,500. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so um, even on yes, the Cape, because those are getting a little expensive, right? You know, <laughs> and yes, I used to have my garbage picked up for me in Hamden, and here I get to have to go to the transfer station. Mm -hmm. But it's it's kind of fun because you meet neighbors at the transfer station, yeah. and and that and I, I really love that. And as I said, I love the commute to to work. You know, going through the little the towns and you know, seeing the, the, the different, the tidal rivers and how they're changing and the boats on the water and that whole thing. It just really appeals to me. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody. I hope that thank was you. enjoyable. And um, as I said, you know, don't hesitate to email, my, email me with questions or give me a call. Andy, we'll thank you very time. much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, you're great. welcome. The great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. Hopefully next time I'll see you all in person. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll be all nice. be going to your gardens. Yeah. <laughs> we'll all be hopefully tomorrow. we'll see you here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Thank Thanks, Naomi. Thank you. You're very Thank welcome. You. Thank you, Andy. And for all the um, gardeners to know, um, probably give me about a week to get everything sorted out and get it posted on the website so that you can share it with your friends. Thank you, Naomi. Thank great. you. Thank Everybody you. have a great day. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.